Welcome to the Wait Not Want Not podcast. I'm Philippa Ross, human ecologist, enthusiologist, author and energy healer, bringing you inspirational interviews, news and tips to rebuild our relationship with nature, revitalizing our natural resources by minimizing waste and maximizing human potential. I trust you'll discover seeds of hope for a vibrant future that you can then cultivate and transform to suit your own lifestyle so we can collectively create a world where reverence for the diversity of all life is honoured. You can find the show notes in the description and lots more about me and my work at philipparoffs.com. Hello Wastebusters, welcome to episode 8. I'm still buzzing from a fantabulous week away in Raglan on the west coast of the North Island here in New Zealand doing a tiny house building workshop. My brain cell has been loaded with tons of theory. My hands have been busy constructing using a multitude of tools and my stomach has been well and truly satiated with a delicious array of home cooked goodies. I had hoped today's episode would be with Everett Norris who ran the workshop but he's busy over the next few weeks. So, as my name means lover of horses, I thought I'd inspire you with a guest who enlightened me about the life lessons horses can teach us. I trained as an equine assisted learning facilitator 16 years ago alongside Ian, where I discovered more about the ways these majestic creatures can help us build a better relationship to ourselves and the world around us. They're phenomenal mentors, literally mirroring human behaviour the evidence of which can be seen in the photo I shared on a blog I wrote called A Quest to Connect, the details of which are in the show notes. So, on to my guest. Ian Benson has acquired a wealth of wisdom from horses, facilitating humanship workshops in New Zealand and Europe. Horses have shown him how human behaviour affects them in different ways, and that when we are more connected to ourselves, we can build a better relationship with the world around us. Experiential learning with horses empowers the individual to take responsibility for affecting the change they want to see, as opposed to feeling victimised by what's happening to them. So, without further ado, let me introduce you to Ian. Welcome to the show, Ian. It's lovely to have you alongside me, as you have been for 17 years now. It's It's been that long. It's it's nice to have this little chat with you. (laughs) And here we are on a slightly more formal basis. Um, I'm just wondering, as I've um, given some preamble as to um, your work, can you describe to our listeners exactly what humanship is and how you see your role with the horses? Well, it used to take me about 30 minutes to explain kind of what I did, but um, now I can I can basically do it in, in one sentence. Okay. It's humanship. Humanship helps people to become better humans for their horse. And what if you so, don't have a horse? Because I know you work, well, you do work with people who have horses, but you also do work with people who don't have horses. Well, the qualities that horses help us to explore and to bring out and to nurture or challenge, perhaps, are those qualities that help us to become better at leading our lives. Right, right. And so, how did you? What is your role with the horses and the humans? I'm well I, sometimes I look at myself as that I'm I'm the one that wipes the steam off the mirror <laughs> so that people can see the reflection but um it's 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 more than just mirroring it's the horses tend to resonate with um what is is in front of them and they interact with with that resonation in real time so what how a horse deals with that is not necessarily a mirror of it it could be a whole range a whole range of behavior and that's, so what's that's, your that's, role in that? My role is to facilitate the process. It's, right. um, I had a discussion with um, accident compensation once about my job, and they said I was a riding school, and I said, no, I'm not. And they said, what do you do? And I said, well, actually, I, I look at myself as being a relationship counsellor between human and horse. And funnily enough, they didn't have a category for that. <laughs> Well, you've always been on the outside, haven't you? So how did you first get into the, this work? Oh, a long story, really. Um, it's, it started as a child. I always wanted a horse, but I was never allowed one. Right. I think my dad thought it was something that girls did. <laughs> um, he, I think he would have preferred me to play rugby or, or so, cricket or something like that, which, which I did to please him. And so I was a very late starter 
with horses. So through my childhood, I had a few friends with horses and I used to annoy them enough to let me ride their horses. And then um, I didn't get my first horse until I was in my late twenties. And I got my first horse with the idea of setting up a horse trekking business. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it was I, I actually at the time, I, I don't know what frightened me more, the idea of working with horses or the idea of working with people. Okay. I, I discovered that the horses were the easy part. Yeah. 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 So in that process of setting up that business and, um, and, and taking a lot of people riding, I got introduced right at the beginning of another way of being with horses. And it was a, it was a way that didn't have a name. So this is 30 years ago. It was, I went to a problem horse workshop and the Australian trainer by the name of Merv Kildee he turned our fire breathing monsters into quiet little lambs in just a space of minutes. And it was, I think for three days, I stood there with my mouth open and just total awe of what was the change that was happening. I really didn't take a lot of notice of what he was doing. Right. And, um, and then at the, at the end of that three day workshop, he went back to Australia and 30 years ago, there was really no information, no books, no, no equipment even um you, youtube didn't exist and the internet, so. have, yeah mm. yes really my my first lesson from that was my horse is my teacher right and so i had to wait a whole year for mr kildy to come back to new zealand before i could have a kind of another dose of it and and really actually start to learn some stuff um so that was that was the very beginning so over the, the subsequent years, I developed my skill and ability with dealing with horses. And then I was having up to three and a half thousand people come riding with me with the horse trekking. Wow. And um, per year. And, and so I became absolutely fascinated with how my horses built relationships with absolute strangers. And it was kind of, there was kind of a point where I could recognize that I could put 10 different people on one horse. Yeah. And it was like having 10 different horses. Really? Yeah. And, and, and it didn't matter what experience level. So you, I could put 10 experienced riders on one horse and it was still 10 different horses. So I came to the idea that perhaps everybody rode or handled a horse exactly how they lived their life. But I didn't really know what to do with that idea. Okay. I just kept observing. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, was like a puzzle to me how does this work and then a friend who's a clinical psychologist she came to learn to ride with me and on about her third lesson she said Ian this hasn't got anything to do with horses this is about me and my fear right write me a therapy program and it's for me I was like what, what do I know about therapy I'm a horse guy I'm a farmer um I know nothing about therapy but it started to crystallize my thoughts into how I was bringing people into contact with horses right. and, and helping them through their, with their interaction with horses. And um, so I did write a therapy program and she brought clients out, mainly children. And it was absolutely mind blowing the impact that horses could have with these, with these children where we weren't even teaching them. Yeah. We were reflecting on the interaction between the between the horse and the child and and the horses the, the horses are such real-time interactors that the children could evolve and 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 find different ways explore different ways of of interacting to see if if the outcome changed I and really that was the beginning of sorry that was the beginning of the humanship idea so the the beauty of of the work is the fact that it's experiential and so um children mm -hmm. you don't have to have an intellectual level um, or any experience of horses to be able to interact with and and gain any benefit from the work with them do you yeah you don't you don't even have to like horses the horses are a, a very good tool if you like or a medium to yeah. help us to get an insight yeah into it yeah and and so and the insights can be it's sometimes it's a little bit like watching paint dry and <laughs> other times it's highly uh, it's highly rich with with material to of insight um and everything in between and it, but it's very very powerful because it's not a human judging or anything like that it's um it's just a process of learning 
And so is, can you give any examples of some of the things that um, the children explored and discovered? Uh, there's one or two that were quite spectacular that I remember in those early years of doing that. It's um, one where there was a child that was asked to lead his pony from the trekking centre to the, the round pen. <clears throat> and he got about 20 metres towards the round pen and the pony turned around and led him back. So he turned the pony around and off they went. It was like a very slow game of tennis, backwards and forwards, for about 40 minutes. Wow. And, and, and so we just let that evolve and, and see what, how, what's going on there. Nothing, nothing really changed. It just kept doing that. So we, we called time because it was coming up towards the end of the session. And he comes over and he said, and he's 10 years old. He said, you know, I can be a good leader but I'm just, I can be so easily led. Wow. Um, so, so profound for such a young child to say that. And so the therapist and I asked him how that affected him, how that was for him at home, at school, with his friends, with his family. And pff, he gave some answer, which was, it was not important. But two weeks later, he came back for the next session and we said, okay, we start where we left off. And he led that pony straight up to the round pen. So there was no... He'd done his homework. Our fingerprints were clear of his process. Something happened in that two-week period, and he became better able to lead the horse as a result of that. That's the beauty of it. I mean, um, having trained with you 16 years ago, um, that's what I really love about it. It's um, There's no intervention, and as you say, you let it carry on for about 40 minutes kind of thing, and it's a journey of ex exploration and not advising or anything else like that and people come to their own conclusions and process it either in in real time at the time or afterwards um and it's again it's about being patient isn't it with the process oh it is because you know i i one of the things i do is i teach or i facilitate learning and, and sometimes it's really hard for me to bite my tongue and breathe through my nose and just allow it to evolve and i know with the therapists or coaches that i'm working with they have a strong desire to do therapy yeah, yeah. and 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 so it's about us both holding back and allowing the process to unfold and that's where the power comes mm. it's true experiential learning they're not talking about it how to do it um, they, they have that freedom to be themselves within that process of, of learning. If I start teaching, uh, there's a, the unsaid message really is be like me. Yeah, and, there's and no, the beauty of the horses is there's no agenda. You can't set, you can set up something like take the horse from A to B, but you cannot um, advise the horse what to do between point A and B. And it's between those individuals and the horses to what happens, eh? Yeah, absolutely. It's um, it, it's one of those things that sometimes you just want to, like when I was in the trekking business, sometimes I just wanted to take that person for a nice little one hour ride. Yeah. But the horses had other ideas sometimes. And it's like, well, actually, this is not going to be just a nice little one hour trek through the river in the bush. It's going to, it's going to be a little bit more of a purpose to <laughs> this. <laughs> <laughs> You know, five o'clock on a Sunday evening when you got the last ride for the day, it, it was sometimes the last thing I felt like doing, but I understood the power of that. And it's, yeah, and, and I was listening to the horses. The horses were basically saying, hey, Ian, we have to go there. Right. This is wow. not about you. It's not about me. It's about this person sitting on my back. Wow. Yeah. If I look at my process and my learning from horses, it's been very much a process of watching paint dry. There's over the years, there haven't been too many of those big aha light bulb moments in my process. It's like, because I think I've had to, the horses have caused me to, to have to look at this stuff in depth and explore every little facet in a slow process. Well, there's been one or two light bulb moments along the way, um, but it, it's, it's been a process for me as well. I, I've had to, had to learn to take the medicine of the horses that they that they dish out to clients is uh, I've had to take that myself too. What's, so so what's I can identify the, perfectly. What's been your biggest learning out of this for yourself? My biggest learning. Hmm. I, I went farming when I left school basically because I didn't really like people. Yeah. And and I didn't like the judgment of people and I always felt 
a little bit of victim of of people and their judgment. So I went farming and, and I always got on well with animals. So really the the thing that I I am eternally thankful to the horses for is bringing me back to people again and helping me to to get along with people and, and to be able to talk and, and explore and, and feel a little more. But the journey still goes on. Yeah. These these days um I spend maybe a third of the year in Europe teaching mm-hmm. mainly in Germany. And the variety of relationships between horses and humans is way more diverse than in little old New Zealand. Right. A, they have a lot more horses, they have a lot more people, um, different environment that the horses are kept in. And so the whole range of problems that people see in their horses, or maybe it's the range of problems that horses see in their people, is way more diverse. And so that intensive time in Europe each year is, is really my school these days. And I learn, I think I learn more and more every year. And this is just ongoing. I never know what I'm going to learn each year. And I think that's the beauty that you know, you never know what is, as you say, you're the facilitator. And so you are just as mm. much in the dark per se as your clients are. Um, and you're, you're just steering it and giving them some guidance as to and feedback as to what's happening and allowing them to interpret it themselves. Yeah, sometimes I, I have to do a little bit of translation, <laughs> as it were, which is yeah, yeah. Kind, kind, kind of ironic because it's, you know, I, I can understand a lot of German, but I can't speak it. Yeah. And I, but I can perfectly understand and, and communicate with horses. Yeah. And it doesn't matter where in the world they are. There is this common language that um that I understand and continually learning and and de- deepening my um my understanding of but communication is I just can't remember the percentages now but tone is one thing but non-verbal communication is something like oh 50 odd percent isn't it it's a huge part it's more than 50 percent I think I think verbal communication is only about seven yeah. percent of our total communication body language is the bulk there's the the expression or the tone or um, the the vocal rather than verbal communication that comes in there. Yeah, it's and horses are pretty much uh, they, they're body language experts. They read body language, and yeah. and so you you really can't lie to them. <laughs> I remember doing the training alongside you, and you were taking yeah. the Mickey out of me. Do you remember this? No. No, you were taking the Mickey then. out of me like you like you do. And the and we stopped and we were laughing and the horse stopped alongside us and had a wee like because you were taking the piss out of me basically. <laughs> Do yeah, you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've had so many experiences to be honest, Philippa, that um, some of them float on by. I thought uh, I should be more profound than that, but never mind. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm working with five or six hundred horses a year, right. and yeah. When did your work evolve from just? Um, ordinary hum, um, humans per se as to as opposed to those that are actually have people that actually have horses and building that relationship with the horse and the human well I realized fairly early on with the development of the of that therapy program and um, subsequently going to the US and training in equine assisted psychotherapy um, but a horse person pushing a modality of therapy in New Zealand was not a particularly easy task and I had a few therapists um, and coaches and people such as yourself that I was working with, Mm -hmm. but I realized I would go broke very, very quickly if that was going to be my exclusive revenue source. It's like lots of people could see it was a good idea, but not a lot of people wanted to pay for it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And and so so then it was just like a natural evolution to to start working with horse people, Mm -hmm. but I couldn't call it therapy, of course, because No. no one would come. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so that, and I was at the same time, I was getting really frustrated by the increasing commercialism of of horsemanship, if you like, or the use of the word horsemanship, and I didn't want to associate with that. And I thought, well, actually, really, what I what I do is humanship, yeah, and really, really pushed that um, uh, into my circle. I remember when I first the word first hit my hit me in the in the head. I did a Google search of the word humanship, mm-hmm. and I got two hits. One was a, a Christian country and Western singer, 
And the other one was something to do with aliens. <laughs> like how many things can you do a Google search on these days and just get two hits? Yep. Yep. Nothing. It's nothing. Yeah. And so I was, I was shocked that it wasn't used. And, and so I, I claimed that word if you, if you like, and, and started using it. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's worked out well. And it does, it does really inspire the imagination a little bit, especially in the horse world mm -hmm. um, of, of what's possible or this different way of working. It's about me, not about the horse. Yeah. The focus comes back to the human. So what are the, the benefits that the people you work with, how, what have they found with the relationship with their horse? How has it helped them? So I think we work with people. And when I say we, I'm talking about referring to Anka, my wife and myself, because these days we work as a team. Since 2009, mm -hmm. we've been working together. Um, and, and she's a clinical or she's a psychologist by trade. And mm -hmm. so she has a different viewpoint, a different skill set. Um, to come in and so we, we complement each other quite well mm -hmm. um, we facilitate a learning process rather than teaching and it's it's really it's all based around the idea of of trust and respect right. and it's a, it's a continual evolution of understanding the idea or the the ideas and the concept of what is respect and really for 30 years I've been exploring this idea of respect and, and how can we bring that to life? You know, the idea of being able to accept another for who and what they are and, and also for what they do without the judgment, without um, controlling it. it. It doesn't mean to say that you agree with what they do or what say, um, if you like, but it's, it's this idea of, of um, not going into the opposition of what someone says or does. And, and that's a, a big emphasis of the work with the horses it's like as human beings we're really good at going into the opposition it's we're quite competitive by nature we, we tend to be power hierarchical driven um quite judgmental and um how how can we bring that to life you know how can i accept what a horse does even though it's not what i want it to do right so we can we can put boundaries around that behavior and to keep us safe and our horse safe and then allow that behavior to carry on. So that kind of moves into another area of respect, which is the freedom of decision within the boundaries of safety. Right. So if we have good, good secure boundaries, and when we're dealing with humans, we have emotional and physical boundaries, mm -hmm. then that keeps everybody concerned safe. And there's the freedom to explore that behavior uh, rather than stepping in and controlling that behavior of another. We just control the borders. Because then, I know from so that, I when I was I was learning to ride around the age of ten or eleven and in England, mm. and I know in England there's very much what you were talking about the hierarchy thing. There's definitely a right and wrong way to ride um, and things, and everything's on a tight rein. So I mm. guess yeah. you know, transposing that from what you're saying, it does give you the perimeters to explore things. Um, and mm -hmm. build that connection with the horse as opposed to seeing the horse as an object to be controlled. Yeah, it's such a balance between the task and the relationship. Yeah. You know, it's I like to do things together with my horse. Yeah. And that's a process. Mm -hmm. How do you get an animal, a creature that has a different set of priorities and survival instincts um, to come to the idea that your idea is a good idea? Right. Yeah. And there's the process that you can go through. And it's, it's maybe if the horse decides that your idea is better than their idea. It's, but how do you do that? How do you bring that to life? And, and so you don't do it by opposition. Right. You yeah. say, okay, let's explore your idea yeah. within the boundaries of safety. And when you get to a point where you realizing that your idea is not the best idea, then you'll try to do something else. You'll, you will do something else. Mm -hmm. And maybe that idea gets a little bit closer to my idea. Maybe it goes the other direction. And so it's just a process of allowing the horse to find another idea. But And all we have to do is just let go of that idea that I'm right and you're wrong yep. and allow that process to continue. And horses are very, very good at finding the easiest path. 
the path of least resistance. Mm -hmm. And they do that by the amount of energy they use. So if they're using more energy, then it's actually necessary to follow your plan as you like, as, as if it were, is then they'll, they'll go that way every time. It's like, oh, okay, they've opened the door that way. I, I, that's the easiest path. Right. Yeah. And so in achieving this, we have to come into the idea that I am not above the horse, that we come, we work from a place of equality and I have a role in the partnership and my horse has a role within that partnership. And it's based on absolute equality. And our individual roles are based on our individual strengths. So, so in, the, in the idea of um, working together with our horse, my strength as a human being is my ability to think forward, if you like, to plan, to have the big picture, the vision. Yeah. Um, and my horse's natural ability, because he's bigger, stronger, and faster than me, he can move in a way that I will never be able to move. Right. So really, we have a planner and a mover coming together. And it's not my job to control my horse's movement. It's my horse's job to come into the self-control of the movement. My job is simply to communicate the movement part of the plan to my horse right. in a way that he can understand and give him feedback. So, so there's that other part is, is clear to a communication mm -hmm. in, in a way that my horse can understand. So th that's basically how, we, how respect works, to allow the other to take the responsibility for their role within the partnership using communication mm -hmm. it's all based in acceptance and non-opposition if you like and of course we have to listen to the horse that's often the bit that we're missing as human beings we listen to ourselves but we never listen to the horse listening is a great the... skill isn't it because you um we listen with intent to answer basically <laughs> mm. yeah and it, and it's you know we with horses the beauty is that you don't listen with your ears <laughs> yeah you, yeah you have to listen you listen with your whole body you have to listen with your intention or your with your mind your your um intuition yeah yeah and 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 then you know if you think that your horse thought about what you were thinking about then it's it's kind of it's there's a nice place to relax and release a little bit and um and go with it what i love about it it's um is that ability to explore and um i think there are many lessons that we can take um at this time that we are in society at the moment um is there are very many different viewpoints to things but actually having the freedom um the the fundamentals that you were talking about is the respect side of things um yeah and, and the trust side of things but giving each other understanding uh another person's strength um mm, and allowing yeah. them to explore it um it seems like amazing that if only this kind of learning could be um integrated into creating communities that would actually help us grow which is really the whole point of the mm. podcast is really about making the best use of our resources our natural resources so you know animals are brilliant communicators we can learn a lot from animals How oh absolutely and it's, yeah it's, so for me i like that one of the the biggest assets that we have is our herd we currently run 23 horses in our herd they're yeah. from i think the youngest is 23 um is three and the oldest is 31. wow there's there's um everybody's in there it's all in the horse the, the young horses they're not born into the herd because there's not really enough space but when they're a week old they come into the herd with their mothers and so they live a, a herd life and it, it's it's like a, the horse herd is like here is like a community it's right. very stable um they have enough to eat they have enough space and they're free to interact and it's for the number of horses that we have, it, 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 we can start looking at that as a community. Right. And, and what we've discovered over the years of, of observing the herd, it's, it's not based in hierarchy. You know, the old view of, of how a horse herd worked is that it was very ordered from the, from the top to the bottom and everybody found their place by who could move who. 
But what we started observing is that um, you might have a situation where horse A moves horse B, horse B moves horse C in the classical hierarchical thinking. But then you see horse C go and move horse A and it throws that whole theory out the window. And, and so what we realized is that these horses come in to find a different role, if you like, within the herd, different roles. And at varying times and varying situations, a different horse will take the lead or take the responsibility for the herd. And so it's some of the, some of the roles are super, super clear. Some we absolutely haven't worked out what they are at all. So we might have, um, we had, uh, we got one horse that everybody thought was the lead gelding, the boss gelding, because he could keep everybody away from the food. He was very, very aggressive. He came from the film industry. He's probably starved as a foal and it's, everything's mine, 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 mine. The whole right. pasture, the whole hay feeder and everything. And then when we observed him, we'd see him running around protecting the hay from everybody else. And all the other horses took one step backwards and waited for him to finish his behavior. And he's using a lot of energy and he's not eating at the same time. And when he was happily eating, all the other horses would go and join him and start eating beside him. So there, so, was, there um, was an understanding of his behavior and allowing him to play it out until he found his place. Basically, well, that was kind of the, yeah, that was, he was very, very nasty at the beginning. He would, he would chase and he would bite and he would make a point. Right. Um, but again, he was still using more energy. Mm -hmm. um, but we, you know, we, to a certain degree, we had to protect the others from him. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we might isolate him a little bit and say, hey, this is your feed here. You can eat on your own with less stress or whatever. Um, but in, in a sense, the, the herd educated him over time. Yeah, yeah. See, a lot of horses, a lot of horses that are born in this world these days are never socialized properly because they might just have them and their mum. And growing up, they might be in a little herd of mares and foals. And then when they're weaned, they go into a young horse herd. It would be, that would be the equivalent of like sending your child to a kindergarten where there's no teacher. Right. Yeah. And so they, they're often not they come into their own patterns of behavior and then when they come into a, a more stable herd they have no idea of the, the culture of that herd the language of the herd the um the relationships within the herd and they just kind of go in there and it's like it's all about me i was just going to ask you is a a definite a definite role that they play according to age at all one year, one the lead mare was taken out. And then when I talk about the lead mare, it's just a role. Right. It's not more important. Yeah. She could have the absolute, have, have the deciding vote, if you like. Um, she was taken out of the herd for one reason or another for quite some time. And the whole herd went into disarray. And one of the young horses took over that role. And the stability of the herd was lost because she was not mature enough. Right. That. When we put, when that lead mare went back into the herd again, wow, it was really dramatic what happened. The only horse that was pleased to see her was that young horse that took over that role. Wow. And the rest of the, and the rest of the herd really, I, I use the word hammered her. Wow. She never, she never, she never came back into that role. Really? She never came back into the lead. Nope. Because she basically abandoned them. And as, as, as my human interpretation of that, it was, yeah, it was really fascinating to watch that. Yeah, and, and sad at the same time, because mm. it was really the whole, it took quite a number of years before we got the stability back in the herd by having a mature um, lead mare again, who, who had grown enough into that role. So we've, we've noticed, some of the roles we've noticed are the, Whenever we put the mare and foal into the herd at about a week, two weeks old, there's one horse that becomes the bodyguard for the foal. Because, of course, everybody wants to come and say hello to the new baby. Yep. And she's very clear about um, educating the herd as to who and when is going to come and be, or even sometimes even look at the foal. Right. 
and it's always it's always the the full siblings and half siblings that get to get to meet first. It's not the lead horses at all right. that come in. They they're much later. Um, we've got a horse that's an integrator. If we put a new horse, which is not that often that we introduce a, a new outside horse into the herd, but um, she comes into action as the integrator. Basically, takes the other horse by the hoof and shows it round and introduces the culture and the language and the other horses and explains the whole situation to them. And sometimes that can be over in five minutes and other times six months for the full wow. integration to happen. Yeah, it's a process. And I actually have seen the integrating mare give up on that job and just pass it off to someone else. It's like, you do it. <laughs> I have no idea. And he was a very complicated horse, actually. He had no social concept at all. And um, he, you know, I think just about every horse in the herd um, it took to bring him into the herd to integrate him. Wow. Yeah, he wow. didn't, he just didn't understand what to do if another horse approached him. He went into a panic. And wow. It was as if he didn't even know what another horse was. But he got there. So and how, was fully you, integrated. how do you see your... Um observations of how a herd works as to how we could be different in the world as humans well i think i think, think the horses have they they, they set an example of how we could live in a community and and so i like to think of my herd not so much as a herd but as a community a yeah. community of very individual beings mm -hmm. and they are they're very individual and they please themselves. I'm just watching the herd yesterday, and um, you know there was some grooming, some playing, some eating, some sleeping, some communi communing with others. Um, it was all going on within the herd. But when when something happens where there's a need for a horse to take a lead and offer some direction, they step up. Depending on the situation, it could be different horses. For different situations right. and so how i see this see see the herd is that there's all of these roles within the herd and neither or not neither none of the roles are more important or less important than any other of the roles in the herd because it takes all of those roles to to help the the community to function yeah. <laughs> and 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 those roles are based on those individual horses strengths what they've right. found that they're good at and and that's how I see that we could base a human community really in in this idea that if we were we could all come into our individual roles within a community, mm -hmm. and those individual roles are based on our individual strengths. Yep. And then we became very very responsible for our role, and and, and then the community can just function. It's Me not about power. No, it's not about power. It, to me, it's about giving people time to explore and discover their strengths, which is a huge part of, because we're kind of yeah. steer, steered to a certain way and there's a resistance and we can, and we feel that I'm, I want to do this, I can't do that with all the judgments concerned. So that's a huge part of things. Yeah, well, like if I look at my life, it's like I went through school. I, I chose not to go to university because I didn't want to. I wanted to learn from basically the university of life, have not a narrow view. I wanted a wide view, and that was a conscious thought, conscious decision. And, you know, my, my, my life keeps changing direction, but I found my passion, and then that passion was the horses. I didn't know why, but I had it right from a very young age. But I found it again. And because I hadn't gone through the system of the horse world, I could think outside of the square yep. and I could take a different view. And so really, and I, I think it's, it's very interesting to see how my journey with horses continues to evolve mm -hmm. from taking tens of thousands of people riding and observing the patterns of the, the horse human relationship to, to going and using that experience to bring people into relationships with horses and and now i see that the next evolution is working working more with people mm -hmm. to help them come into the, to some other ideas of how how they could live how they could live within community how communities can live within other communities or alongside other communities and it's it's 
really all based in, in the, the power of the horse, what the horse is teaching. So in this process of learning, I've identified about 50 different qualities of leadership that horses are continually working with us on, mm. helping to nurture these qualities, helping to bring these qualities into balance with each other. And it's, it's absolutely fascinating to the level and the depth that they, they work, and not just at a physical level, definitely mentally, emotionally as well. And the leadership so, qualities, um, can you share some of the ones that you've identified? Because they're not really something that you can learn in the classroom, are they? No, no. It's, it's like, well, it's, it's all based around trust and respect. Yep. And, and so you could just put a whole book about those two words. Um, then we've got <clears throat> about being present, being here now. It's this, there's the, the realistic ones of, of planning and communicating and um, focus and awareness, determination, consistency, persistency, courage, um, creativity, gratitude, um, humor plays a definite role in it all. Um, the ability to make decisions. Yeah, there's, there's just so many. I've got, it, I've got it written down somewhere. One day I'll get the list out and I'll, I'll, I'll read it and go through it. That's fascinating, um, so yeah. The, and it, then it is, goes it? back to what you were saying at the beginning, it allowed, that awareness allows us to take responsibility for ourselves and be accountable for our actions and see the other people's reactions to us and um, yeah and it, it's, it's so easy to work with horses and, and to see how it works with horses because horses don't have the agenda they don't have a um ulterior motive or anything like that mm -hmm. they're just purely present here and now and they respond with what is happening here and now yeah and whether it's what we want them to do or not it's they're, they're, that's how they think they have to respond to it mm. um whereas us human beings are a little bit more complicated and because yeah. you have an ego. Well, absolutely. Oh, totally. Yeah. If you, if you think think about how you, what you said about you learning how to ride when you're about 10 and, mm -hmm. and it was all about control because really it's, it's taught from a fear base. You're, you're told that you do this, this, and this mm -hmm. just in case the horse wants to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And then you're told to do, that, that, and that, when the horse has done that. Yeah, yeah. You know, so you, you're never in the moment, you're never interacting in real time. You're either anticipating or you're reacting. Yeah. You're not responding in real time. And, and so, and that's the scary place to be. That's the most frightening place to be is in the I'm moment. Really because too. that's, yeah. And, but you're, with horses, you're always called to action. Yeah. That's what life does. Every moment, it calls us to action. Mm -hmm. What do we do? Do we go and do what we always did and just, you know, watch another movie <laughs> or yeah, go and eat something or, or whatever? Or do we come into action? And it's noticing you know? the changes because I can remember an exercise where you're um, going around the arena. And again, mm -hmm. it's, it's that same old thing. If you, you keep doing the same old, you can't expect a different outcome kind of thing. But it's amazing. Yeah, yeah how without being present you don't notice the, the shifts the changes so you might um hmm. put your foot forward or something and so you're kind of projecting your energy in the direction that you want it to go but you don't actually notice some people don't notice the change of behavior in the horse so they keep doing what they've always done and don't notice yeah. that change and make the change yeah. themselves yeah or the other one is that you don't know you don't notice the the things that you do yep. um, that express a totally different idea to the horse to what you think you're expressing to the horse. Ah, miscommunication. Miscommunication, it's, it's all the time. So you know, every time I ask my horse a question and it gives me a different response to what I was looking for, the first place I look is to myself. Yeah. Because I have to I check in and it's like, am I asking the right question? Because what I found is very often horses are giving the correct answer to the question being asked, except the person thinks they're asking a different question. Oh, you can, I mean, you can see that reflected in life, can't you, with, between humans, oh, big time, because totally. we, get, we get bollocked if we're not giving the right, res the response that the other person is expecting. 
and we are yeah are we judged for that absolutely big time mm. and it, and if you think about our education system it's, it's very much like that it's yeah. like it doesn't encourage people to think outside of the square or question mm -hmm. it's more like the sausage machine you've got to churn out the right answers and um and that's where i like the horses is because there's room to room to move because i i would say there's there's all there's many roads that lead to rome yeah yeah and it, and it's it's not the, the destination that's important what's important is the journey absolutely. how you get there absolutely yeah and again yeah. i think particularly one of the things i've learned over time is patience and actually enjoying yeah. that process so it's not something that we're taught because it is all about the destination if you do x then you will you will feel happy but there's always something mm. else because it's part of being human that we aspire to that mm -hmm. mm. yeah so again, exactly and it's, it's, being being present and enjoying the present moment and seeing it for what it is yeah well one of the one of the things i ask to a lot of people that are really goal driven and we put them on a horse and it's like okay so what's the destination of your life yeah and the answer is death. That's where we're all heading for. Right. And then I say, are you in a, are you in a hurry to get there? <laughs> yeah. For me, it's the journey to that point that's the important part of that. Yeah. And 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 so it's what happens along the way. And it's and another friend actually was really interesting. She she was continually for many many years looking for her path in life. Yeah. And then she. Then she realized that the only way to see your path is to turn around and look where you've come from. Fascinating you should say that because, I mean, particularly in the world, you know, the new age and spirituality and everything. Um, and again, a lot of the leadership qualities that you were talking about, you know, they're kind of um, fashionable words um, in different, mm -hmm. in different um, circles. And yeah. now I've forgotten what I was talking about. Can you help me? <laughs> finding the path finding the path yeah so that is a big thing with people is like what is my purpose in life it's like hmm. and again like you say it's that big goal sort of thing and as you say turn around and look where you've come from and connecting those dots so your own story of the horses and things like that my own story if i if i look back at a number of different things i've done i worked in tv and radio and so here I am doing a podcast being, you know, being an element of some of the work that I've learned sort of thing and bringing together all the things that fascinate me in order to move forward. I've got no idea where any of this is going. I haven't got a, you know, a beacon that I'm following to, to get there. It just feels right in the moment. And the guess exactly where you are. Yeah, absolutely. You know, at the moment where, where I am, I'm at the end of my path that I've created. Yep. from this point forward i can go anywhere yeah yeah because there is no path the opportunity to go anywhere is is there it's it's fascinating when you look back at your path though and and, and say so what does my path look like mm -hmm. behind me the one that i've trod is it a series of detours straight lines wiggly lines does it go round and round in circles yeah um what is there dead end roads that you've had to return down and yeah with the lost opportunities it's it's the it's just it's such one a powerful method. metaphor oh, it is it is a powerful thing and it's actually there is no right or wrong way there is something that can be no. from whichever direction you go so is it in exactly. saying that okay just to round things off has there been a person or a book that has actually inspired you and how have they there's been so many over the years yeah um I think if I look at there's two books that kind of stand out for me. Um, one was Louise Hay book, You Can Heal Your Life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And another one was part of the, the Tom Brown Jr. Um, it, what was it called? I can't remember the series, the tracker series. And, and the key lesson from that was this idea of that we're, we're spiritual beings here for a physical journey. Yeah rather than being um, physical beings here for a spiritual journey and and it's about listening to the higher message 
and walking the path on the earth and the physical realm and applying that, bringing that together. So we have to walk a duality between the higher thought and the and the physical action. Um, so those are two books that spring to mind and, and two in, inspirations that, that's, that have come from that. But um, yeah, there's many, many people and that have appeared in my life, either in for real or um, through a book or other medium that, that have inspired me, have, have given me an idea. I'm a person that I like concepts. Yeah. And if I can get a concept and then think, oh, okay, how does this apply and how can I apply it? How can you integrate and, it into uh, what you're doing? One and, way integrate of, it, yeah. One way of integrating, well, I found for myself anyway, is um, um, music because it energizes me in – well, it can lift me up or it can calm me down. Is there any particular type of music that energizes you? Um, actually, music's been missing from my life for quite some time. Actually, the only time I ever really listened to music was um, if I'm driving the car from somewhere. Right. And, um, you know, driving driving around um, Germany on the autobahn where there's a lack of speed limit. I like really heavy rock <laughs> music. <laughs> from my teenage years um rebel but, rebel, but it, yeah it's it's kind of i i would say that i i like all music or, or most music maybe not the techno stuff but um it's some things really do get inside me and resonate and it, it could be from any genre and any artist um so you say yeah, it's been it's, I'm, I'm just, from your I'm, life. Are you? Is it? Have you found it coming back in, or is there a reason? Or, I mean, I'm someone actually. If I'm trying, to... I don't know. I read a read a funny expression one day, many many years ago. It was like, um, the day you get married is the day your record collection stops growing. <laughs> and <laughs> I don't know where that came from, but it, it it proved to be actually true for me. So I've got a whole pile of records and tapes down in my barn, and. Um, <laughs> but I've got nothing to play them on. So <laughs> at the moment, I, I just pop on Spotify and, and just see what they play me. All right. And um, so I'm just kind of coming, coming back into music again. But I can go, go for days without listening to any music whatsoever. So yeah. is talking of inspiration, is there any quotes that you like that um, a bit like your books that are kind of concepts fundamental that um, have influenced you? Now that I go to think of it, I can't even speak it. Um, oh, it all works out in the end. Right. But if, if it hasn't worked out, you obviously haven't got to the end. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> and mm -hmm. the, that kind of... Um, mirrors what you what you were saying about purpose you know and it life being um, a process sort of thing because we haven't got to the end mm. yeah love it love exactly. it exactly you know mm. it's just a journey enjoy mm. the enjoy the moments every moment and there's a lot of moments in in every moment yeah yes. so yeah. It's, it's the idea is to to embrace each of those moments and learn from them experience them see what there is without going over the top Yes, and we I don't. Just, you don't have you, you to, to live extra special. It just sitting outside and watching the tree swaying, or something like that, or suddenly catching the sound of a bird, or cloud watching, or something like that. It doesn't have mm. to be big or um, changing you know, something that's going to change the world. But mm. if you could change one thing in the world, what would it be, and why? Well, I always got this philosophy in my work that there's only one thing in this world that we can change directly, and that's ourselves. Awesome. And 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 really, if because if I if I set out to change someone else, another person, for example, then I'm I'm, I'm going to use ways that don't build healthy relationships. Fantastic. And and so it it all starts here within me, and I have to take responsibility for for me everything that I do, everything I don't do. And be responsible that 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 is what I'm creating in my life, whether it's good or bad experience. It's just experience. And so, and I have to take responsibility for creating it. Nobody's done it to me. Mm. And and so I have to stand in my power and take that responsibility. That's and, massive. And, and, That's yeah. a massive thing for people. And I think, you know, because we're of the same age and you know, slightly older farts and some, but 
there are um, an increasing number of younger people who are actually seeing that and um, yeah. making and influencing. And again, if we take responsibility for ourselves, that exponentially has an effect on, has a ripple effect on other people it's, as well. It's the only way to make the world a better place. Yeah, yeah. We are living in a world that we are we are creating and continuing to create. We yeah. each have to take the responsibility for that. It's no point in blaming anybody else for the world that we live in. Mm. If we mm. all took responsibility, then we can create whatever we want in this world that we live in, because it's our world. Absolutely. I'm, as part, I'm just part of it as much as you're part of it, and everybody that's listening to this is part of our world. So collectively, we can make great changes, eh? What a great way to end, totally. the, in, end the interview. Yeah. Bless you, Ian, for your insight totally. and wisdom. And um, here's to a, um, a lovely journey ahead. Well, thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to, to talk. You're welcome. You're welcome. Take care. Bye. I'll be introducing you to a couple of other mentors in the coming weeks. One is a writer and the other a web wizard, both of whom have shown true grit to be in the world using their gifts for the greater good of all. So until then, dig deep, open your mind to a world of possibilities, live life with a generous heart and take steps to minimise waste and maximise your own potential. <laughs>